but I try to convey the emotion with sound alone um, and let it stand alone. And part of the thing about that is that you can paint your own picture on it. You smell that? It's the smell of spring, boys and girls. And here I am, sitting here watching four beautiful red cardinals pick through my yard as they do their little courting that is so textbook with this season. Bees buzz on the freshly blossomed flowers. It's inspiring, you know? I feel an immense sense of pride from this program. And let me give you a little bit of background in case you're new. I started this program to bring you one hour of introspection, joy, music, and deep discussion because I have a passion for music and people. The waves of emotions I get from listening to music of certain times in my life is irreplaceable. And we call that nostalgia, right? That's the Greek word with the etymology simultaneously meaning homecoming and pain. It's a beautiful word, isn't it? I just want to take a moment to appreciate the architects of language, which give us the tools to convey such complex emotions and phenomena such as nostalgia. But I digress. I had always tried playing music, but was never confident in my abilities to play guitar or bass or sing. But a somewhat constant thing in my life was I wanted to do radio. For years and years, people told me that they enjoyed my voice and that I would be suited for uh, doing radio, that they think people would enjoy listening to me. And I just never pursued it for several reasons. However, the idea of having a platform to play music and bring people the deep joy and reverence from it that I have felt, it has always enticed me. So here I am, doing just that. And it's simply one of the best decisions that I have ever made for myself. To pursue what really drives me, what makes me feel like I'm contributing something to the world, and I implore all of you to do the same. Go out there and chase your passion, not just for yourself, but for everyone you come in contact with. Because the happier you are, the better interactions that you have with people in your day-to-day -day life. And feeling good is truly infectious. I know that that's cliche, but it's so true. But uh, yeah, caring for yourself is one of the most important things you can do. So love yourself, do everything that makes you happy, and I promise you, you deserve it. But here's the thing. I am at a place in my life where I have all of that kind of stuff figured out. So what I'm doing with this program is I am helping people who are not in such a great situation financially or otherwise. And today I have a project from Donor C and it's from India. Uh, these people rescued uh, these, these girls from human trafficking uh, situations and what they need is air conditioning units to cool down the, uh, the places where they're at during the intense Delhi summer. And in their notes here, uh, temperatures reach up to 114 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, making it impossible to study and play. So uh, a little bit goes a long way. I would really encourage you all to uh, donate to this project. She had another one that I was going to share uh, this week and uh, I think there was a dozen girls that they rescued and they were getting them uh, situated with clothes and book, book bags for school and whatnot. And I can think of no better project than something like this where, you know, sex slavery is quite possibly the worst crime that you could commit against someone, arguably as bad or worse than murder. You know, I mean, it's, it's a pretty terrible thing to, to enslave someone and force them into that. So, anyway, this is a really good cause, so I would appreciate it. Even uh, five or ten bucks really goes a long way to uh, go on helping this out. And uh, at this time, there is only $140 left to fund it. So, yeah, I would appreciate it, and so would they if you would donate. But let's get into today's interview. Uh, this one was done through Skype, as you'll notice, and there's a little bit of interruption in the uh, service here. I'm still working out doing these interviews remotely through Skype, so uh, bear with me as I do that. I think you're going to see a lot more of those, and it kind of opens up my uh, the range of people that I can get for guests, which is really cool and exciting. But uh, anyway, I will let my guest introduce himself, 
and I will see you at the end for my goodbyes. My name is Cody Fedler, and uh, I'm a Nashville-based artist. Um, I used to live up in that uh, northern Iowa area. I grew up there. I'm um, actually not too far away from you in Manly, Iowa, um, actually. I grew up in the country, um, and I didn't really have, like, a whole lot of access to uh, people around me. My brother and sister were a lot older than me, and they'd kind of moved on to other things and I guess I just kind of uh, immersed myself in music. And uh, from there, I mean, I started playing the drums because my dad was always a drummer. Um, then I went on to piano and started playing guitar. And uh, I joined this band at the time we were called Dead Note um, with this vocalist you'll hear later, um, Will Bartz, incredible vocalist. Um, and that was just kind of like a straight rock and roll um, going hard kind of balls to the wall all rock and roll kind of sound with it and we all kind of moved down to nashville and since then i've kind of branched out into some weird territory with my music um exploring different sounds and techniques um i consider myself more of a sound enthusiast than a musician actually um i i don't know if that's pretentious to say but i mean it's just the way that my it's just the way my brain kind of works with it. Um, cause I really like to explore, um, different noises and sounds that you wouldn't normally expect to hear in music. Um, under that, uh, under that project, I kind of go by the name DJ analog. Um, I'm, I've dialed back using that moniker a little bit because <laughs> I was playing a show in Ames one time and they wrote my name on the chalkboard out front at a uh, DG's tap house. I don't know if you've ever spent time in Ames or whatever, but a little um, bit, but I'm not familiar. They, uh, they wrote my name on the chalkboard out in front of the bar. And as drunk college kids are apt to do, uh, they erased some of the letters. So it just said DJ anal. <laughs> and it, it's kind of, of stuck with my head a little bit. And I'm like, well, maybe I should just drop that entirely and i've <laughs> kind of been moving more into the territory of um like cinematic uh style music and, and really like ambient stuff okay just under my regular name cody fedler so okay cool yeah so so you do do like dj work then well it's not necessarily dj work and that's the other thing that's like, like uh <laughs> the reason i'm kind of ditching that name is because okay. it's just a fall spinning records or anything um the stuff that i was doing live was mostly um it was live looping is what it was so i would play guitar piano and drums and i would route it all and be this basic basically just this one-man band and it's actually kind of incredible what you can with uh that kind of setup it's it's almost unlimited what you can do with the technology available these days right absolutely uh, I, I go and see this guy every once in a while. He goes by that one guy and he's just a one man show. Have you oh, heard yeah. of him at all? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He's incredible. He's a yeah. great guitar player and yeah, he does, he does some really cool stuff. Yeah. Funny story about him. Uh, he was going to play this festival back in Clear Lake and one of the last guys that I interviewed, he's from Dead Larry. I'm not sure if you know who they are. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Joe Scarfalino. I've spent plenty of time at uh, Laredo's in Mason City. Oh yeah, yeah, that's kind of their uh, kind of their spot to hit in North Iowa, most definitely. But uh, but he was telling me that his friend is actually was the producer for that, and just so many things fell through for that festival. One of them being that that one guy's magic pipe got stolen out of his van somewhere, <laughs> and I just happened to be at a festival that he was at like a week or two after. At a, at a place called Fat Fest, and I ran into him, and I was like, hey, man, like, I heard your magic pipe got stolen because you were supposed to play this festival in my hometown, and, <laughs> you know, it was just a weird occasion, but he had, like, thrown together something to use for the festival, and he was, like, all concerned, <laughs> you know, because, you know, how artists are, they get all self-conscious, and, like, you know, everything's got to be perfect, so he's like, oh, did it sound any different? And I'm like, I didn't tell any, you know, couldn't tell any difference, but... You know, I'm just a spectator dancing in the, 
in the crowd, probably half drunk. So <laughs> I'm not, I'm not really a sound producer to, to give you proper feedback, but. Sure. Yeah. Us, us musicians, we're a, yeah, we're a superstitious bunch sometimes. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I'm sure he was very attached to it because it's not just like, I mean, artists have attachments to their guitars. I'm sure musicians. Um, but I mean, I'm sure there is an extra special attachment to something where, you know, he's got a bass, a guitar, sampling board you know it, that that magic pipe is really quite a piece of equipment <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> but i am curious um I, I am curious to ask about you growing up i mean we've got a lot of mutual friends on facebook so did you did you go to uh school in in like uh ventura or something or no I went to school in uh, Manly, Iowa. Um, yeah, I was kind of looking through our Facebook friends, and it's like, it's just crazy that we never crossed paths. Um, I yeah, know I feel that like I've, I've heard your name. Heard your name. Yeah. Yeah, I know that I've heard your name around town, and yeah. like, you know, we've probably sat like across the bar from each other, like, and not even like yeah. given two thoughts about it. I'm sure we've um, been at the same parties or something too, maybe. <laughs> yeah, stuff, stuff like that. But uh, yeah, I just uh, kind of got in with. Um, yeah, maybe a few people from uh, Clear Lake um, after high school, mostly. Um, I was hanging around with just, you know, the few people uh, like Janelle and uh, mm -hmm. Michaela. Sure. I think, um, you know, just random people. Kind of lost touch with a lot of those folks, actually, um, yeah, since we moved down happens. here to Nashville. But, um, yeah, it's just kind of crazy. I was... I was looking at that too, and I was like, "How have we ever crossed paths?" Right. Did you? You used to work for uh, Sweetwater, is that right? Oh no. Am I? No. no? Uh, I'm thinking I, of a different person then. That's uh, <laughs> that's Nick. You might be thinking of. Um, he actually okay. he does currently work for Sweetwater, if that's who you're thinking of. But um, it might be. I don't um, know. But but yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah, it's crazy. I I just saw in the suggested friends like. I saw your profile picture and it was like you playing a guitar. So I was like, oh, hey, I'm looking for musicians to, to chat <laughs> yeah. with. So and I've been exploring doing this remote interview thing. So I figured I'd hit you sure. up. And, and yeah, well, I've kind of been a recluse a lot of the time that I was living up there, too, to be honest. Um, I mean, like I said, I lived out in the country, so. And I didn't really have like internet or video games or anything. And I really just immersed myself in the music while I was living out in that area. Um, sure. But then I moved to, you know, Mason City for a while. And that's probably about the time that we had a bunch of mutual friends. And then sure. after that, I actually moved to Ames just uh, with the band uh, Dead Note. We're currently called the Euclids now. But, uh, you know, I moved down there with them. And yeah, just. It's been a, it's been an awesome time for sure. So uh, I I mean I grew up in Clear Lake, so I don't really know what it's like growing up on the farm necessarily. I, I certainly was like the farm was in my backyard, but <laughs> but I didn't live the farm life. I mean, did your family legitimately farm like livestock and, and no corn no and it was like that? no it was just uh, my dad had an had a whim with. Uh, my mom and they moved out into this country. They bought an acreage. Mm -hmm. We had like a barn and stuff. We never really had any livestock or grew crops. Like they had a garden and stuff. I mean, it's a it's a gorgeous property. And you know, we have like this kind of grove out back that I would spend a lot of time into, where it was just like trees. You know, and when you're you know only three feet tall, you know the trees stretch you know farther than you can see but really it's only maybe like a football field's worth of trees sure. that go back yeah. you know yeah no mind and, uh, go ahead it, yeah uh, uh beyond that you know my grandma's house was like that too i spent a lot of time outdoors like that and then yeah when i wasn't outdoors like i said i was inside playing the piano or my dad was a drummer so we always had a drum set set up in the basement nice and uh yeah yeah, there's a there's a certain virtue that comes from growing up in the rural parts, you know, and and when we we were growing up, it's like the kind of the uh, uh, post industrial age, if you will. So jobs are kind of scarce, but there's but there's still something worth living in a place like that. You know, you're sort of more connected to nature, and I do notice uh, living 
sort of in the cities that that I I do feel sort of disconnected and I long for going camping and stuff like that especially during this time of year when it's just starting to warm up and it's like I just really want to go out <laughs> yeah uh, that's actually a theme that I um, like to inject in my music a lot um, as far as just going back to nature and um, getting away especially living in Nashville right now where you can't look up and see a single star in the sky oh, it's sure just crazy living in this like hustle bustle kind of area going into that and yeah a lot of the lighter piano stuff especially the last track uh or the one of the tracks of uh, spring that we're going to be listening to here um really kind of embodies that whole uh being inside the city and still looking for nature and seeing it kind of sprout out in certain areas but it, it's never it's never allowed to blossom and it's this weird thing you can see like the squirrels you know running down the pavement and <laughs> they they don't know what they're doing you know it's it's weird um or like how birds uh their sleep cycles are messed up in a big city because of the lights um uh-huh. and it actually causes um crazy problems with like the ecosystems inside cities Huh. And like I said, I like to explore that those kind of themes, even though a lot of it's instrumental. Um, I try to bring those out with different sounds and different uh, emotional tones, if you will, I guess. Sure. There is a sort of yin and yang in living in cities because you're so close to culture, right? But you're far away oh, from yeah. nature. So it's like you're fighting your your desire to be close to a community that you can be a part of, but at the same time, you're you know, primitive self sort of longs for, for that connection with nature. So. Yeah. It's like this evolutionary hangover in your brain. That's like yearning to go back to it. And I'm actually, we're actually kind of lucky here in Nashville. There's a lot of, uh, nature parks and like, there's like a national park, just like in the middle of the city kind of maybe it's a state park or something like that but there's this like nature area that spans quite a quite a bit of the city Mm -hmm. um just a little bit away from where we live and uh my wife and i like to go hiking out there occasionally so nice yeah so i'm kind of curious to know how did you end up down in nashville your whole band moved down there that's a that's a pretty good spot to go for uh for a band and i mean it's really competitive music wise I yeah mean, yeah it's definitely definitely really competitive down here i can say that without a doubt but um, at the same time there's but, there's um, more opportunity there than probably oh, yeah, anywhere absolutely. else absolutely it's just one of those things where we decided um where it was like we were all living in ames at the time and we were uh enjoying quite a bit of success in Ames at the time and it was pretty cool um but we kind of decided um just on a whim um well we had actually recorded down here um we had gotten into contact with uh with a guy uh, named John Elefante who was the current who's the current singer for the band Kansas who uh recorded our last album and he you know we went down there and recorded with him and we explored the city a little bit for that week, week and a half that we were down here. And we just decided how much we loved it, realized how much opportunity we would have not only as a band, but individually, you know, for other aspects of the, you know, music industry that we would might want to pursue. So yeah, it's just been this whirlwind trip, um, that we've been on, uh, for the past almost three years now, it'll be three years in August. Um, that we've been down here and I can honestly say that it's probably been the best decision that I've ever made, um, was moving, um, out of that area. Not to say that I don't miss it, but moving out of that area and, um, coming to a place where, like you said, there's a ton of opportunity. Um, and even if it's not necessarily to quote unquote, you can't see me in podcast land, but I'm making air quotes with my fingers. (laughs) Um, but uh, even if it's not, quote unquote, to uh, make it big, um, you can still pursue things that you just wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Um, stuff like, uh, well, like I said, I was, I'm working on some like cinematic type stuff. And mm-hmm. aside from, you know, playing in bars around 
you know, Iowa, there's not a whole lot of opportunity to do that kind of thing. Or, or I've even been branching out into Foley work, like sound effects for, um, you know, movies and stuff, movies and games a little bit. Um, oh, cool. haven't really gotten into it yet, but I'm working on it. Um, and like I said, it's just the opportunities down here just pop up all the time. Right. Yeah, I can definitely relate to you know, moving out of, out of Iowa where, yeah, like you said, I, I love Iowa. I love all the people there. And, and there were several things that, um, you know, worked into me moving. It certainly wasn't to, to, you know, take a leap forward like yourself and go, you know, kind of pursue your dream in a way. I mean, um, it, because t- a, a musician moving to Nashville, that's like, that's your goal you know, is to go there and, and kind of make it. Whereas me, I was just trying to, you know, go somewhere where I knew I would have a stable job and be kind of closer to the action as, as it were in relation to live music, because I just hated having to drive up to, to Minneapolis or down to Des Moines to go see a band, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Because I just love oh, yeah, live music so thing, much. So th- yeah, there's stuff to do constantly. So that's, that's always a plus for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's kind of a beautiful thing when a band stays together and moves together. I mean, that, that really shows a sense of brotherhood that you have with those guys. Oh yeah. I mean, we've been, uh, we've been playing together for, God, it's gotta be about 10 years now, actually, okay. that we've been, you know, playing together, um, since high school, just playing in, uh, Will's garage, um, Grafton, like just, hmm you know, not knowing anything about any of the instruments we were even holding at the time. And we were just like figuring it out. Um, I think there's, there's like this quote from Dave Grohl who, I mean, Hmm. he says basically like, you know, the whole point of being in a band is you get together when you're like 15 or 16 and you, you lock yourself in your friend's garage and you just suck. (laughs) And that's what you do. You just, suck and then you keep sucking until you don't suck anymore and yeah. that's pretty much what we were doing i mean you just got to have like a passion for it i guess and you know keep working on it even if there are disagreements in you know between people you can still keep on working for it and work past those things yeah and i'm sure a music theory professor would turn their nose at dave grohl's uh you know comments there <laughs> I'm sorry, man. You're kind of cutting out. <laughs> oh, that's that's fine. Uh, so I, I said I'm sure I'm sure that some music theory professors would kind of turn their nose at Dave Grohl's comments there, but but it's so true. You know, when I was younger, it, it, and I was I kind of I didn't play in like a formal band, but me and uh, uh, I played bass. My friend played guitar, and my other friend played drums, and we just like just had a lot of fun doing covers and and just jamming and it it was just a sense you know of catharsis for us and we didn't really have a goal at all i mean it was just just sort of having fun so i think there's value in that even if you aren't being classically trained or you know even moving in a direction of professional musician right right um yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's the most important part is just have fun with it. Um, I think there's a lot of people who get lost in, um, like I said, quote unquote, trying to make it big, or you know, they want to sell out a show in Madison Square Garden, but they don't want to play, you know, Laredo's in Mason City, you know, for 15, 20 people. They they don't want to go through those steps, and it's this weird thing. Um, it, you actually see it a lot down here in Nashville, and I'm. I don't want to like speak poorly of anyone in particular, but it's like you see a lot of that. Like, I I just want to be big. I just want to be the next big thing, and mm-hmm. they don't want to have the experience of it at all. And it's kind of sad. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, part of it for me, um, a lot of it actually is exploring these sonic capabilities that we have. And like, um, one of the things that I really really enjoy about music is the way that it can actually have physiological effects on like the human brain. Like I've been doing, I've been doing a lot of uh, studying into uh, different like frequencies and stuff like that. And like listening to a lot of soundscapes and like, it can have a powerful effect on people. Like there's, there's no doubt about it that sound is like one of the most 
important aspect to us as humanity. Um, we have these like evolutionary ticks that are a holdover from, you know, before we were even classified as humans, like, uh, the sound of a baby crying. If you play that for somebody who's under a brain scan, it lights up like a Christmas tree, like nothing else. <laughs> and it's, it's incredible the way that certain sounds can activate people's psyche in certain ways. Um, and a lot of it is, like I said, like an evolutionary hangover where, um, you know, we used to hear this low 40 hertz rumble. And even today, we still associate that with danger, um, like large predators growling or thunder. Mm -hmm. And it gives us, like, that's what gives you chills when you listen to music. It's this part of your brain that's associating it with something that isn't still there, but it's still there to your brain, if that makes sense at all. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and I think what you're what you're getting at is uh, binaural beats. And uh, I've been I've been kind of following that phenomenon for a little bit. I listened to this podcast about human optimization and he had a guy on there and he was talking about how you can listen to certain frequencies while you're like working out, for example, and it'll uh, release the hormones at the right times and whatnot if you time it correctly. And and it's just, you know, there, there are just sort of unlimited possibilities that you can do to manipulate your own mind or obviously someone else's. Uh, one of the weapons that they use in riot uh, uh, police is this sort of uh, huge woofer that, that puts yeah, out like yeah, this I've huge high frequency uh, sound and it just like shuts down people's, you know, central nervous system. You just like have to stop and like curl up and your muscles yeah. tense up. And so, yeah, it's, it completely it's, incapacitates people. It's, it's insane. The type yeah. of stuff that, you know, sound is capable of doing or like, um, what's the other one? Um, the, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but basically there's this delay effect where if you hear your voice played back at you while you're speaking, it will jam your speech and actually force you to stop talking huh. and you stutter over your words. And it's, I, I mean, you, you might've encountered it while you're recording yeah. every once in a while, like latency issues and you just, you, you stop and you, st you, you, you can't get the words out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I <laughs> actually did. I actually did have that issue when I first started and I had no idea what I was doing uh, <laughs> and I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to fix it. So, so yeah, it was really awkward for me to try to learn how to use it and whatnot. And then, you know, just uh, at work, sometimes I have to use a walkie talkie and you'll be talking to someone else, but you'll be hearing your own voice from someone else's oh, no. walkie right next to you. <laughs> and oh yeah, so, so I know exactly what you mean. And I thought it was just me not being able to separate, you know, my, what I'm trying to say with what I'm hearing I mean, I guess that is what's happening, but, yeah, but I didn't. It's just our, our dumb human brains not being able to comprehend, you know, technology because it moves so fast. You know, it's like, I mean, the stuff that, you know, will be available tomorrow, we can't even conceive of even. And the fact that evolution even moves so much slower than our brains are capable of moving even puts an additional hindrance on that. So, um yeah, no, it's totally normal. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me feel a little bit better, at least. Um, but hey, uh, why don't we get into your music here? Uh, what I'd like to start with is uh, this this track you sent me with your band. Um, what's what's the name of your band again? Yeah, it's the Euclids. The um, Euclids. Uh, I'm glad I didn't say it because I was going to say yeah, the like Elucids the... or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the uh, he's was like a Greek. Uh, he invented geometry, is what he did. Euclid ah. was a, you know, mathematician, ancient Greece. Those Greeks. And, and, and speaking yeah. of the Greeks and music, um, I think the guy's name was like exactly. Uh, oh, what was his name? I really don't remember. He was a, he was like a predecessor of uh, Archimedes, and he created the Western standard. Yeah, that eight, that eight note scale. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a Greek invention, and uh, yeah, that's another thing that I've been meaning to explore 
um, is like micro tones and stuff. I haven't really gotten into it yet, but I've really been wanting to explore into that. I'm going to need to figure out how to do it um, the way that I want to, but that's definitely something I've been wanting to get into. Yeah, keep me posted, definitely. Um, but, um, but yeah, this song, Social Damage, and I think um, there's definitely like a political overtone to uh, your your vocalist's you know lyrics in here but i but i don't think they're partisan necessarily like like it's speaking to this 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 phenomenon you know yeah it's something we can all kind of relate to um and even though it was written you know a few years ago i i think it's never been more true than now um it's really um lambasting like the current state of the media and i mean like it or not there is a lot of fake news out there um mm -hmm. i don't care if you're part of the right or part of the left I mean, it's just true. Um, yeah. The amount of sheer just crap that's thrown about and it doesn't make any sense. And, and it's hard to discern what's real and what's not. And uh, with the lyrics of this song, it really, um, you know, digs into, you know, the fact that the mass media definitely likes to lie to people. And we talk about propaganda as if it's something that only happens in other countries, but realistically, it's definitely something that happens here. Um, you know, you hear all about how the crime is, you know, the crime is off the charts and, you know, there's a terrorist attack, you know, across the sea or whatever, but actually, like, the reality of it, it doesn't line up with that. Um, I was listening to a podcast uh, the other day that was actually talking about how um, we're back actually living in like this golden age of humanity and we don't mm -hmm. realize it because of how much news we consume. Yeah. And, you know, crime is at an all time low across like the entire world and less people are in poverty than ever have been before. Um, one crazy statistic they threw out was that more people died in the first three days of a uh, Vietnam conflict than have died in Iraq and Afghanistan since we've been deployed there. But you're sure to hear about it when something does go wrong over there. And it's not that it's happening more often. It's that we hear about it more often. Sure. And that's a form of propaganda in itself. And I think it fuels fear and it fuels hatred. And yeah, that's really what the song is about. Interesting. Yeah, that's that's a really good point about how we're kind of safer now than we ever have been. Uh, I've heard a lot of stories about, for example, um, people's children. Uh, they'll they'll let their kids like go down the street for pizza or something like that for lunch. You know, like they're they're eight and they're ten year old. And yeah, and, and and that's and, a totally and, normal thing. Yeah, I mean, I did it when I was a kid, and I thought, oh, maybe that's just because I grew up in a small town. Which actually, in rural parts, um, you're you're far more likely to be abducted as a child and have a violent crime committed against you. In, in rural America than you do actually in, in the cities because there are, it's l less densely populated. So people are less likely to, you know, come to a, a person's aid. Um, but that but, makes sense. But yeah. anyway, um, you know, it, when, when we were kids, it was actually a lot more dangerous than it is now. Um, it, but despite that, people think that we're living in, and like you said, it, it does contribute to, uh, the way the media spins stories and spins statistics to make us feel like we we need some sort of, you know, uh, not governing force, but some sort of like like worry to have, you know, to justify to justify some sort of draconian uh, penalties on people. And and yeah, we we definitely live in a time where you are far less likely to have your child abducted by any normal person, but the the police will come and take your kid and it's kind of silly to me that you know it's like they go and kidnap your kid to keep your kid from getting kidnapped you know and and the parents the parents won't hear about it they, they you know they'll be like oh wow little timmy and and little johnny didn't come back from pe the pizza place you know for like two hours I should probably they must have got abducted. Yeah, yeah. So they go. <laughs> yeah, that's and the worry, first thing that's going into their head. And they go to the police and and you know get them taken away by child protective services because they let them walk down the street. And it's like, I mean, this is one specific story that I heard, but it really got me thinking. You know, like, I don't know. Perhaps the the governing forces are trying to do something 
good because they're worried about something happening to your kids. But in, in effect, they are doing the same thing that they're worried about happening. Yeah, it's very, very hypocritical as far as that yeah. goes. And um, yeah, to draw it back to more of the media, too, it's like I think the media really portrays this whole um, doomsayer um, persona on the world. And it's just, you know, that contributes to legislation being made to make that kind of thing happen because mm -hmm. people call for it. And I mean, you know, it's not not to say that democracy is a bad thing, but that's just kind of the way that the cookie crumbles as far as democracy goes, sure. I guess. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, like I said, I think it's a really poignant today uh, more than anything um, just because of all the crazy stuff with the alternative facts. Again, finger quotes that you can't see, but alternative facts and fake news and all this all this stuff you keep hearing about that people go on and on about. I'm just sitting here thinking, like, can't we all just get along? Can't we all just, like, <laughs> sit down and, like, play some music and, like, have, have a beer? Yeah. <laughs> can we do that? <laughs> I definitely understand. And I try to I try to stay away from politics, but I, can't, I just can't help it sometimes. You know, like, yeah. it's just such a big part of who I am. So I know it's going to just leach through into these interviews. Sure. But... But anyway, I, well, especially it, when you're talking with musicians, a lot, a lot of songs, yeah. a lot of songs have this very politically charged message. But I, I, you pointed out this one; it's not partisan at all. Like it's definitely a thing that will resonate on both sides. So.
that distrust in the media and distrust in the establishment is what led to the phenomenon of Trump. So, so if we're being honest with ourselves, this, this song, you know, even though, uh, in retrospect, wasn't talking about now, I think it shows a certain, uh, lyrical genius on your, uh, your bandmates part to, uh, write something that is certainly holds up to the, to the test of time. Well, he'll appreciate hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> right on. And, but, and, um, but to get to the, the instrumental part of this, um, I, I hear this song and I think of myself like, like in a sports bar, you know, like, <laughs> sure, <laughs> like hanging sure, out and yeah. having a couple beers, like it's really feel good and like music that a lot of people can, can sort of get behind. And, and that's what I kind of get from your guys's, your guys's sound. Um, but, but at the same time, it's not just like Buck Cherry where it's just like the rhythm guitar and that's it. You know, you're, you're really driving a pretty solid harmony in there. I try, I try that. Yeah. Yeah. I try to try to get as much in as I can, I guess, um, especially with this song. It really needed a lot of energy. So I, I yeah. put that into uh, as much of the guitar work as I could with it. So right on. And then the, uh, the next one that I wanted to talk about was, was spring. And you mentioned this a little bit earlier. Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so like I said, I've been uh, exploring these like soundscape kind of things um, lately. And um, when you asked me for three songs, uh, this was uh, one that kind of popped into my head, possibly because I've been working on it um, so, so closely for the past couple weeks. Um, And uh, like I like I was talking about earlier, how sound can have physiological effects on the human brain. Um, there's really uh, a lot of time and effort to put into making those background noises shine through and try to have those effects. I showed it to a friend of mine uh, the other day, and there's like this creaky noise at the beginning of it, and he's just like, he's hearing it, and he's like, I don't like that noise. It makes me feel uncomfortable. And I just looked at him and I was like, good, I'm glad it has that effect on you. <laughs> because the whole, I mean, the song, it, it kind of explores, uh, well, like I was talking about earlier, um, springtime in the uh, city. Uh, but more specifically, the transition of winter into spring and then into fall again. And that like creaky noise in the background, it kind of, kind of digs at your spine a little bit and um yeah it kind of feels like you're waking up coming out of winter a little bit and yeah it's a little uncomfortable but then you get into this uh second uh movement i guess if you will of the song this middle section um which is very flowery and open and very uh lush sounding you know like spring is apt to be um and then the end, you know, recedes, um, kind of falls back, sounds a little bit dead at the end. Um, there's this uh, high pass filter that we threw on there um, to kind of symbolize fall, um, you know, where things are kind of, you know, dying down a little bit and getting back into, uh, you know, the that state of matter, I guess, if you will. Um, and yeah, I guess it's part of this whole series that I've been working on that I've been trying to pitch through uh, movies, TV, and games and stuff. Uh, I mean, shameless plug here. If anybody is developing a game or something and likes the song, let me know. Um, you know, you can use it. Just uh, let me know that you used it, I guess. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much the whole gist of it. Um, you know, and it's instrumental. So uh, part of the thing about me is that I don't sing at all. Well, I mean, I do sing, but not very well. Um, so, and I've never really been a vocalist, uh, but I try to convey the emotion with sound alone um, and let it stand alone. And part of the thing about that is that you can paint your own picture on it. You can put yourself into those, into the shoes of where the song is taking you. And you don't have to be told this song should make you feel like this you know you should be able to step into it and kind of see your own vision of it and i think that's the real magical thing about music honestly
about this before I hit record here, but I have a, a deep appreciation for instrumental music where, um, to share one story, when I was younger, there was a band called The Secret Machines, and they're not an all-instrumental band, but one of their songs is like a very, very kind of shoegazy sort of droning song where it just I love that kind of music man I it, love that where you can just get lost in the effects and all that crazy stuff in the background man that's real ethereal type stuff I yeah, like that yeah yeah and I, and I love it and uh, I was showing it to this girl who's um she she was a good friend of mine and we sort of like to just drive around in Clear Lake and listen to music in her car because there's not really much else to do, <laughs> it, it, you know. Yeah, I mean, days. what are you going to do when you're that age, you know? <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that's where sort of a deep appreciation for music came from for me is that uh, that it gave me something uh, to sort of uh, feel catharsis and, and sort of latch onto. But, but we were listening to this song, and I was like, or she was saying, Oh, like, where's the words? Like, this is kind of boring. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, this is awesome. About? This is okay. awesome. Aren't you feeling? <laughs> aren't you feeling this? Like, I don't have to hear any words. I don't need the poetry. I mean, I'm certainly appreciating it when when it is in music, when it's appropriate. But uh, this is what's appropriate now to me. And I was just kind of blown away by that. And I just don't. Most people, I feel like, don't ever come out of that. Um, I was just listening to a podcast recently with. Uh, are you familiar with uh, very much post rock like uh, Caspian and Godspeed, Black Emperor, stuff like oh, that? Oh yeah, yeah. I've been listening to a lot of the Godspeed, you Black Emperor lately. Um, yeah, a lot of that stuff, the shoegazy, yeah, post rock stuff, uh, Mogwai, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I've I love that stuff. I I need to get more into it. Honestly, um, I feel very very entry level with my knowledge of it. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're. I'm glad you're familiar at least. Uh, after we're done with this, I'll give you some suggestions to listen to because I'm I'm quite a fan. Oh, I like yeah. I like to put on music when I'm reading, and and I'll put on you know instrumental rock music like that just to have good background music because it helps me concentrate. Um. So so but anyway, this guy from a band called Caspian was talking about how a guy at a show they were doing one of these really uh, these songs that were supposed to be introspective and make you make you really think about yourself and yeah, yeah. and this guy just like yelled out boring and uh <laughs> and it, and i just i just know how many people think like that and i don't know it just kind of breaks my heart that that people can't just sit and appreciate music for what it is uh like you'll hear it shows all the time people are hollering out songs that they want to hear it's just like motherfucker this isn't a jukebox you paid to see these people play but you you don't have the final say in it like <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, to the other end of the spectrum, I mean, there's other music that, you know, we might not enjoy that those people find incredibly invigorating. Right. And I'm actually working on a new project right now. I don't listen to a whole lot of just straight pop music, um, but I've actually been working on like this just very straightforward pop album because it it's, it's putting me outside of my comfort zone a little bit, and it's actually really fun to make. I don't enjoy listening to it at all, though. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But it's, you know, it's very fun to make at the same time, and, you know, I know that there are people out there who will enjoy it, and, uh -huh. you know, uh, there's a fine line that you kind of have to walk between, like, artistic integrity and, like, making stuff that you want to make, but... I think there's a middle ground that you can hit and please both sides of the of the aisle, I guess, if you will. Yeah, and, and I suppose if you're trying to do what you're doing, which is you're trying to kind of get into uh, more commercial music where you, more commercial music where you can make, you know, a living off of it, which I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. Uh, one of the first interviews I had on uh, he was talking about doing the same kind of thing where he would just love to just make, you know, short little two, three minute songs for, for commercials and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think there's anything. I'll tell you, at all. I, I tell you what my dream job would be honestly is to get on board with like a children's, uh, television show and uh -huh. just like do the incidental music for it. You know, like there's a duck character that comes on and I, you know, 
pull up an <laughs> oboe sound on my keyboard and yeah. just play like wah, 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 something like, <laughs> like that. That would be an absolute like dream job for me. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but I that's kind of off topic with that. But People that um, get into children's entertainment, I think they have a blessed job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably have a lot of fun with it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and your, your customers aren't too picky as long as they've had their nap, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Um, so and then uh, the, the last song you had for us here uh, is called Zombie Drones. Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about that, what that's all about. Oh, man. Are you, are you ready for this? Because this is going to get pretty weird. Quite ready. I, I, hope you're, I hope you're adequately prepared. So Zombie Drones is kind of this pet project of mine that I've been mulling around in my head. And to be honest, this song might not even get used for the project, but it's this idea that I've been working with for, I don't know, the past five years, honestly. And it's a sci-fi rock opera that I've been toying with. And so let me just set the stage for you here. Um, 10,000 BC, you know, around the time of the uh, last ice age and uh, zombies are uh, plentiful on the earth. Um, the ice age rolls around and they kind of get frozen because they're not warm blooded, right? They get frozen. And so time passes and they are, uh, they're still preserved under the Russian tundra. You know, the Russian tundra, there's some in Alaska, there's probably some in like Antarctica and stuff. So you kind of fast forward a little bit here and you go into uh, the part about like Rasputin being kind of into the occult, you know, maybe he was a little bit of a zombie. I don't know if you're familiar with the history of Rasputin. <laughs> you know what's really, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but what's really funny about this is I listened to a podcast called Hardcore History. And, uh, yeah. I'm oh yeah. With Dan Carlin. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Fan. And I'm <laughs> yeah. listening to the one about world war one right now. And he just got done, you know, he takes like 45 minutes and talks about Rasputin. And I mean, I've heard the name because there's a beer named after him. It's a really delicious sure. beer, by the way. Um, did, did he touch on, uh, his death at all? Yeah. Oh, and how, how crazy like, it was to yeah, try to kill him. Yeah. And it's, uh, well, he talks about how it, it may be shrouded in uh, mysticism a little bit because there's, you know, he's sort of, like you said, shrouded in the occult. So, yeah. So, so there's yeah. kind of a Sto mythos. Stories spread. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a sort <laughs> of mythos to him. Definitely. Um, but I guess for the, for the listeners who might not be familiar, um, Rasputin supposedly, and this is taken with a grain of salt, um, but supposedly he was shot like six times, mm -hmm. got up, like spit in the dude's face. Then they stabbed him and he still didn't die. And then they poisoned him and he still didn't die. And they ended up having to like chop him up and throw him in the river or something like that. And his body was never found afterwards or something crazy like that. I, I admittedly need to do a little bit more research into it. Um, but you know, that's part of the mythos of this sci-fi fantasy world that I'm laying out here. Um, you go beyond that, uh, you go into how uh, in World War II, uh, the Nazis were, again, really into the occult. Um, they stormed into Russia. They uh, had to retreat. Maybe it was because of the zombies. I don't know. Maybe. It could have been. We don't know. We're not saying it was. We're not saying it wasn't. But... <laughs> You know, the evidence might be there. So here's where it really gets crazy. So World War II ends, and we go into this Cold War era America where, well, weirdly enough, we are uh, going against Russia tit for tat in this, uh, in this arms race, and we find out that maybe there's some zombies down there, and conveniently... We ratify Alaska around this same time as a state. Hmm. Not saying it's because of the zombies, not saying it is. I'm just saying it kind of lines up here, you know, it's kind of <laughs> crazy. Uh, and then uh, it kind of explores into uh, global warming coming about, and we're afraid that these zombies might thaw out. And here's the thing about uh, sci fi that I really enjoy is that it touches on. It, it touches on like social issues that are prevalent today mm -hmm. and um, the next part of it, so the song is called Zombie Drones 
and the next part of the story would be um, where the military is trying to uh, put like neural links in these zombies and utilize them as uh, like super soldiers to fight the Russians. So this takes place in the not too distant future. So I know, kind of crazy. You might have bitten, <laughs> bitten off a little bit more than you can chew by asking me about this song. I apologize if it's rambling a little bit. I hope it becomes this crazy, awesome rock opera in the future. And if anybody wants to help me make it, I am down. <laughs> I, I hope that someone does reach out to you because now I, it, you've, you've laid the, uh, the framework for it and now I want to see it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, it makes too much sense. I get a lot into, like, conspiracy theories, not because I believe them necessarily, but because, you know, sometimes they make a little bit too much sense, you know, <laughs> that kind yeah. of thing. So it's like, and it's very interesting. And I just thought one day, like, like I said, like five years ago, I was like, what if I laid out my own little conspiracy theory that's based on like no facts, but like I connected dots that weren't necessarily there. And I've been just building upon that for the past five years. And this is where I'm at so far. So um, it's another instrumental track. So take that how it is, I guess. Sure. Um, so, so just kind of imagine um, a World War II documentary uh, fused with, um, I don't know, like Les Mis or something like that in Game of Thrones. Maybe imagine that. Yeah. That and and a zombie film in there. Yes. <laughs> yes. Maybe maybe a little uh, Evil Dead yeah. in there. <laughs> <laughs>
And you mentioned something about how uh, how sci-fi sort of is is this this extension of the current day um, news or or whatever's happening in the world. And, and I've talked about this on the show before, but but I think that's a really apt analogy or or uh, you know thing to talk about because when um, when they started making uh, nukes and they figured out what they could do, there was all this sci-fi that started coming around that was about basically humans having this weapon that they couldn't control, you know, and, oh, yeah. and, and could the, destroy the world. The ramifications of it, the whole, you know, the whole uh, franchise of Godzilla is based off of that idea sure. of not being able to control nature and trying to become this god and, you know, watching it destroy you instead right so yeah yeah and i mean that's that's something that comes full circle a lot in sci-fi you know it's it, it hap we see that archetype all the time and and i don't think it ever gets old as long as you know the filmmakers are really creative about it you know like we all still love zombie flicks for example you know there's something right there's something right with that <laughs> with that archetype so but, uh, yeah, I, think, I think it's time to make that. <laughs> it's time to make that little rock opera thing. Yeah. It's it's right for the picking. <laughs> I'm into it. Um, but uh, but I think this leads pretty well into my uh, final question, which is: Do you remember a time in your childhood when you realized your mortality? Well, that's a pretty deep question, and I'm I. I've been listening to your podcast a little bit, so I knew the question was coming up. Um, and I was thinking about it, and I honestly don't think that there was any single moment that uh, made me think about my mortality specifically, but it's always been this creeping thing. And I don't think, as humans, we're actually capable of understanding our own mortality as far as that goes. And I think that's why religion has been, for lack of a better term, invented or relied upon for a lot of people is because it's this coping mechanism. Now, I'm not going to say, you know, that it's wrong or, you know, religion is wrong or if religion is right or anything like that. Like, whatever you believe, you believe. And, and I, I hope you're right for your benefit, you know. Um, but I don't think as humans we're capable of understanding like what infinity is. Um, I was listening to something that uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson was talking about um, a while ago. Yeah, yeah, where he was talking about how different, yeah, different uh, infinities are bigger than other infinities. And like it just blows, it's this whole other realm of thought that I don't think a lot of people have ever considered. And yeah, as far as like a single moment that I've had to wrestle with my own mortality, I don't think I have. Um, but it is kind of this creeping thing that I think it's common for people to think about um, their own you know, what are you going to do next? I mean, I'm just kind of worried about like what I'm going to do, you know, in the next hour after this, you know, you know, I might make some more music or, you know, I might, uh, you know, have something to eat after this, you know, but, uh, as far as like wrestling with the idea of mortality, that's, it's, it's a hard question, man. It's a hard question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely put people in a hard spot because I feel like that, uh, it's something we all sort of think about and, and anyone who, you know, even if you're super religious, you definitely, you definitely worry about it because what, no matter what, you know, that your body, you know, whatever you think about a soul or a spirit, your body ends and there's, there is a finality in that. So there is something definitely to worry about. And we spend a lot of time and, and a lot of, we make a lot of efforts to, to run away from that fear or that feeling of nothingness, nothinglessness. Um, so, so yeah, I, I definitely understand why it can be hard to put into words because, because it's an emotional thing, right? I mean, how, how do you put in words that one, one day you're going to be here and the next day you're not, and you have no idea when it's going to happen 
Or even worse, let's say you're uh, terminally ill and you do know when it's going to happen. That's almost more terrifying to me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't imagine. Like if somebody handed me a piece of paper with the date and time of my death, I, yeah, I'd throw it right back in their face. That's <laughs> That's that's not right, man. You can't do that to somebody. <laughs> yeah, it's a, that's a certain kind of terror, man. I, I can't even imagine. You know, I was I was actually just thinking about this. Um, you know, to go back to the original question, like I said, I don't think I ever thought about a single moment where um, I realized about mortality, but I'm thinking about a certain time that I know for a fact that I didn't. And... I'm like hitting my head right now because I'm like remembering this time. I was probably like three or four years old and my grandma died and like I went to the funeral and everything, but I was just so young that I don't think I like comprehended what was actually happening at the time. I didn't like necessarily know that she wasn't going to be around to bake cookies with anymore, you know? And I was just so young that, like, maybe that concept eluded me. Um, I think I even remember maybe, like, a few weeks later, um, we were going to my other grandma's house, and my brother said, you know, get your shoes on, we're going to grandma's house. And I think I asked him, like, which grandma? You know, <laughs> like, I, I can specifically, like, remember that moment where it wasn't necessarily that I recognized it but i was oblivious to it so right, i don't know right. if that helps yeah so so you just didn't understand that she was gone yeah yeah, yeah that's that, uh, that's i crazy. suppose that's probably the moment you know that you know when he said uh, yeah i'll never forget this he said what do you what do you think you know when i asked which grandma he's like what do you think you know, huh. because he was old, he was old enough to know, and I'm sure I probably offended him when I asked him which grandma. Right. You know, and so wow. yeah, that was probably the moment. Interesting. Fi final answer. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, were you brought up religious? Well, I wouldn't say like tightly religious. Um, I mean, I went to church, uh, Lutheran, um, got confirmed, went to Sunday school. Um, but it wasn't ever a huge pressure. Uh, my family has always been super supportive, um, and I'm super grateful for that. Uh, that you know, even in music, you know, they've always been super supportive of me pursuing that kind of thing. And you know, with when religion, you know, like I said, they were like, you know, get confirmed, and then after that whatever you decide, you decide. So after I got confirmed, I just said, you know, I don't want to go to church anymore. I was pretty angsty teenager, mm -hmm. <laughs> as I'm sure we, we all kind of were. And, uh, yeah, if you hung out yeah. with the same people as I did and listened to the same kind of music, I, I think I know where you're coming <laughs> from. <laughs> How old yeah, are you? Yeah. I'm uh 25. Okay. So you're just, just a little bit younger than me. I'm, I'm 27, but yeah, I still, you know, same folks, same music, I'm sure, that you were yeah. influenced by. Um, yeah, and it's it's all part of that uh, generational thing, too. I think we were uh, probably given a lot of freedom. Um, I'm sure you were, too, just, uh, you know, to explore. And I think, um, I don't know how old your parents were, but, you know, I think the common teachings at the time that we were, you know, maybe growing up was more or less laissez-faire let them figure it out on their own kind of thing mm -hmm. and who knows maybe maybe it'll work out in the end in favor of that maybe when i'm like 60 years old i'll see the light more air quotes but maybe i'll <laughs> see the light and say like what have i done you know i've wasted my time i need to go you know explore religion whatever religion that may be yeah yeah um i i mean i certainly was was able to, uh, my mom was very socially liberal and whatnot. So, so I, I definitely had a certain kind of freedom, but she also didn't like that. I didn't want to keep going to, to church. Uh, I was raised Lutheran too. Actually, if, uh, if you were to poll everybody who has been on this program, it's been mostly Lutheran people, <laughs> which is, I think that just speaks to, you know, the, uh, 
the demographic in the Midwest, I suppose, that a lot of a lot of Bohemian Protestants and whatnot. So it sort of lends itself to that. Um, which, which sort of reminds me, I need to branch out more <laughs> into, into different demographics of, of musicians, but, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but I think we're going to wrap up there, man. Um, unless you have yeah, anything else you'd like cool. to say. Um, I guess there was one other thing that I guess I would want to kind of explore as far as, uh, this conversation we were just having, um, kind of a weird tick about me philosophically. I actually don't believe in good or evil is mm-hmm. part of my psyche. Like, I don't believe that I believe in stupidity and I believe in ignorance and I believe people can be misguided, but I don't believe that there's any such thing as like true evil in this world. You know, somebody can kill another person and I believe that they believe that that was right, you know? So I I don't know how you can say that that is evil. You can say it's wrong. You can say it's wrong in the context of our society. Yeah, immoral maybe, but evil is this weird concept that I think we've invented as a species, and I just think that's really interesting in and of itself. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny you bring that up. I often have that conversation with people, um, and and I I do kind of deny the existence of evil because because yeah, there are psychopaths, there are sociopaths, but evil is certainly something that's. Uh, that's bathed in mysticism and I am very much a materialist. So I try to, uh, avoid any kind of, of mythical interpretation of how people are, you know, like, like I, I, I just can't, it, it makes them seem biblical to me and I just can't, I can't, I can't jive with it. You know, I just, I just can't, but yeah, anyway, um, how about, uh, why don't you tell us where, where people can find you and your band? and uh you know put out any plugs that you got yeah it's actually a pretty exciting time for us right now uh with the euclids uh you can find us on facebook uh we're updating a lot of stuff on there um uh, just the euclids on facebook uh we're recording a new album right now um it's getting a lot more psychedelic with the stuff that we're doing um me personally um you can find me on facebook at cody fedler music um or i still have the uh soundcloud dj analog or bandcamp dj analog as well and i'm planning on putting out some new music on that here um within the next probably couple months or so awesome well uh, i'd like to thank you for setting aside the time to uh sit down and do an interview with me and uh share some of your music oh no thank you man thank you seriously like again it's just one of those weird things like we haven't crossed <laughs> paths and it's just when you reached out to me i was like yeah i have a lot of sh- i have a lot of shit going on right now that cool. i can talk about <laughs> right on right on all right well thanks man yeah thanks a lot all right that's all i have for you this week folks uh i would like to remind you to go and check out this week's charity project at donorc.com slash project slash 633 and just a reminder this is a good cause to uh, get these uh, rescued children some cooling during the intense deli summer so uh, this is the uh, time of year when it starts to get really warm there so it would really help out if you could donate to that cause and as i said at the beginning there there's only 140 dollars left to fund this so we're not very far away and a little bit goes a long way but uh anyway i appreciate you all listening and please 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 share this with your friends or anybody you can think of that would enjoy this program anyone who has an enthusiasm for music and is just generally interested in some awesome stories with some awesome people So that's all I have for you. I'm signing off for this week. I will see you next Thursday, but until then, take care of yourself.